that's kind of conversation between the soul. That's conversation between the soul and the night. Hello, Prestige Heads, and welcome to American Prestige. I'm Danny Bessner. Derek is out. I gave him one day off and no more. And I'm very excited to be joined by Lexi Alexander. Lexi is a Palestinian-American filmmaker, and she's here to talk about what it feels like to be a Palestinian-American filmmaker in this moment. So, Lexi, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> so why don't we just start uh, at that basic question. Uh, what is it like to be in the entertainment industry right now as a Palestinian American? I imagine with connections to the conflict and all of that stuff, given given the awful bombardment of Gaza that is going on right now um, by the Israeli military in response to the Hamas attacks of October 7th. Yeah, it's an interesting time because obviously emotions are running strong. Um, death, war, terrorism is something um, I hope we all hate and want to finish and get rid of and finally, you know, eventually live in a peaceful world. Uh, so when stuff like this happens, um, it it becomes very interesting because unfortunately, instead of uniting us, it, it, it often becomes different camps. And that's very much uh, like it right now in, in Hollywood. Obviously, I'm sure you've seen the trades. There's already been, I think yesterday, there was a very big agent at CAA, um, I think, demoted or uh, kicked off the board. She's taking some time to think, think through something. So what happened yeah. was Maha Dahil, who is a very powerful agent at uh, CAA, one of the big three talent agencies, retweeted something that I think referred to um, the attacks in Gaza as genocide. And it seems that the reference to genocide is what resulted in her taking some time away or, or subtle demotion. I think that's what's happening. Correct. I mean, we, we are just taking what's in the trade, so I can go by that. But, you know, that, of course, has an effect. It has an effect on other people in the industry, on what now they are willing to say. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that it, it is creating a great divide right now. Um, it, it is such an interesting time because many of us, I would say, people of color and people in the global south, um, believe this is a white supremacy issue. You know, I don't think everybody believes that about Israel. Um, and I'm not necessarily, you know, here to debate that point, but there is something to be said that you will not find a person of color, even in Hollywood, who doesn't agree with us. They might not say something out of fear. They might not necessarily show up at the protest, but I can tell you they're all in my DMs and they're all in chat groups talking how horrible it is. And there's just a real fear of being in the industry industry, and coming out and talking about, you know, we, we want the bombing in Gaza to end. And, you know, I think Palestinians, we as Palestinians are very much used to the world ignoring our plight. You know, it's been going on for 75 years we have a much longer memory than um, October 7th, you know, and there's a certain, I think we all kind of are born and grow up with this frustration of like, why is nobody ever listening to us, you know? Um, so, you know, a lot of my friends, you know, secretly or privately telling me they are on our side, they're just afraid to say something. It doesn't really bother me that much, but what I do notice is that we are in this phase in Hollywood where we've already done the Times Up and Me Too. And, you know, in America, we had Black Lives Matter. And um, I don't think a lot of people realize right now the, you know, divide they're creating um, because not a lot of our allies are talking. You know, um, I think if they would see what's going on worldwide in terms of the protest and also, maybe on Twitter, who is speaking, who is in generally, you know, saying, look, this needs to stop. Um, they would see that right now, you know, basically people of color don't feel safe around white people in Hollywood. 
It, so this is is really interesting, and I don't, I don't think this is going to be a podcast where we'll discuss like whiteness and Jewishness because I think it's a very complex history. Where at points in history Jews were were not white, and at points in history they they are white, and it's very complex. So let's just leave that to the side. But I'm very interested right now in Hollywood in the last five, ten ish years, really since Black Lives Matter, has it seems to me, and tell me if you think I'm wrong, made a concerted effort to really bring in more marginalized voices, people of color, women, maybe less so from the global South. At least that's the public perception. Has that been real um, or has it been more of a cover? Because the cynical take on diversity, equity, and inclusion is that it's just a way for corporations to cover their asses. And you get you know one other voice in here maybe sometimes, but it's not actually real. So I think it's actually important to set the context in order to understand what's going in Hollywood. Right. So what's your take on that? Has it been a real evolution or revolution? No, it or hasn't. Really? I mean, I would say that as a side, you know, I have to say it's very hard to talk about this issue without talking about whiteness, whether all Israelis are white or whether all Jews consider themselves white or identify as white. Um, I'm not putting that up to question. I myself am mixed. And so, um, you know, I've been in the situation where people yell at me for not identifying as a person of color and people yell at me for identifying as a person right. of and color. And in America, so it, Arabs occupy a strange space due exactly. to various legal rulings in like the Midwest exactly. in the 30s and the 40s. So it, this, exactly. this, this question gets very, very complicated about Who's it white, is. who's not. <laughs> yeah. But I think in a sense of whiteness, we ha we can't completely eradicate it here because I, I also see what's going on. And the question you just asked me is basically all about that. You know, if we just say, let's say there is a white group that doesn't necessarily fit into any of the minority groups, they're not underrepresented. I mean, white men and white women are just simply not underrepresented. You know, white women may be in directing, but... Again, this is, you know, the numbers are, you know, very, very different when you go to black women or women of color or indigenous women. And so I would consider we are all, I don't think anybody would argue who the real minorities are here. And so when there has been a movement, you know, a lot of the companies had to jump on it um, and they thought it would be good for the website to have that diverse. We are very diverse. And, and like you said, you know, um, and then there is also the Hollywood element where people really want to be seen as liberals. They want to win Oscars for those movies that, you know, the Queen book and, you know, all those things where later on all of black Twitter goes, what the heck, you know, like, what was that all about? You know, but that that's just kind of an element of the, the liberal Hollywood person that thinks of himself as I'm going to make a movie, a feminist movie, and I'm going to win an Oscar with it. And I, I think we're still kind of there. And then all of a sudden this push happened and the push was loud and it was aggressive. And, you know, a lot of agents did a thing that I really, you know, um, we all thought was really dangerous, but we couldn't stop is where they basically would tell their white clients, you're not getting work because everybody is hiring people of color. I've heard you know? that from several people. I'm working yeah. on a piece for Harper's and the WGA, and that sort of attitude really bring, breeds resentment, right. you know, and, and, and anger. I, I, could, I could tell from the people I speak with. And you heard it too, like you heard, um, you know, it's, it's a very small industry. So it's not like there's a group of white people sitting somewhere saying something and it, this doesn't leak out to people of color. I, for example, am one of those people where almost on every job I'm at, there will be an assistant that I haven't actually met face to face. But, you know, Hollywood people like executives and agents often forget that their assistants are always on the phone. I don't know why they forget that. But you wouldn't believe, because I'm an outspoken activist, because people know I, I, I you know, people have probably forgotten this now, but I was one of five women who got the ACLU to get the EOC to file a lawsuit for discrimination against women directors. And it was very funny because we were completely persona non grata and then that came out in the New York Times and everybody jumped on it and all these other women directors took credit for it, which was fine because we, I think we made a change. But I've always been on this. So, And also being an outspoken Palestinian, I, I get the kids that just join Hollywood that they may be facing some discrimination and all of a sudden they're in my uh, 
private mailbox on Twitter and telling me something I don't even want to hear, really, because I, I'm not, it's not my job. Nobody's paying me to be the diversity, you know, um, unfortunately, I probably would be a, a good person doing it, but they don't want people like us to actually be their diversity advisors, because um, I think we are too honest about it. So often I get these young assistants telling me things that are happening. I mean, there's times I got audio files of phone calls where that resentment was, you know, audible. It, it, and, I, and part of me understands it because it's such a competitive business that now you're taking like one leg from under the table on top of it, you know, by saying, oh, all these people, I have to hire people of color and women. And it, it's becoming there's a certain fear like, oh my God, I already was struggling. Am I not going to make it at all? Am I not going to get staffed because some show has to hire that one black person and that one, you know, Latina woman or, or whatever. And so there was already that there. And now you are finding yourself, but you know, what they had to do was basically perform what we call performative activism and performative diversity hirings where Everybody pretends that's the right thing to do, but nobody actually feels it's the right, right. thing to and do. Right, and this is, and this, uh, let me just interrupt very quickly because this seems to be the fundamental tension of capitalism. You know, like if, if in, a, in, a, in an area of restricted resources, you're going to be, breed these type of resentments if people are viewed as, whether rightly or probably mostly wrongly, I would say, my understanding of the issue, as sort of taking someone else's spot. Right. So you have this system that that is, is almost designed to breed resentment. And frankly, this might be too hard because people are generally liberal and genuinely liberal in Hollywood, sort of a racial resentment about, you know, v viewed as, as having, like you said, their leg cut out from under them. So what do you do in a capitalist system that's inevitably going to basically tear workers apart? Well, you know, that, you know, I don't really have the answer for that, but, you know, I can tell you as someone on the other side of that, who's often felt the resentment of an entire crew because they Googled you and they know you the outspoken Arab feminist. And so they immediately think I don't have any skills. Never mind. I was Oscar uh, nominated for an Oscar. I've made multiple movies that won awards. Uh, I walk on a, you know, WBTV show that, you know, anybody else would think, wow, that's pretty big credentials to do a show like that. But I'm considered like, oh, they had to give the Arab woman a break, you know. And so you feel that resentment from the crew because, you know, that crew, a lot of them are on the list to direct. They want to direct. So it, it's for us and we have our own private chat groups that have nothing to do with the corporate times up, right? Because they it turned all, all the hashtags turned very corporate and the real activists really had nothing to do with it. But we have our own chat groups and we talk about these things and it's it's been difficult for us and we had to figure out so how do we get it from the performative activism and um, diversity to to getting it actually to real inclusion and this is an interesting interesting moment in time right now because it almost feels like everybody's taking their gloves off and says the quiet part out loud um you know i i was in this um chat group that was created uh, for the strike um, because I'm a member of the DGA and a member of the Writers Guild. And uh, everybody famous you can imagine who is a writer and a director was in that group. And it was a very productive group um, during the strike. A lot of good things were discussed. And all of a sudden, October 7th happens and it, it had to go into Israel and Palestine. And you know, what I think was really sad was that some of the famous people who were talking about, you know, Hamas, the terrorists, and everybody should make, you know, th there was a big push for the writer's guild to make an announcement. Why are they making not an announcement? Now, you actually do have about four or five Arabs in that group, and we all immediately went quiet, and it was uncomfortable. But not only that, Almost every black writer and director is on our side, you know, almost every Asian is because the, the, the thing about being a, a minority or being an underrepresented group, deep down inside, you know, eventually it's coming at you. You know, you, you're not safe around white people who are oppressing another people. And this was definitely whether we can talk the debate about are Jews white, are they not white, who is white? 
this was definitely, I would say, a white group. You know, this I would was, say in 2023, America, Jews are white. I yeah. just think when people refer to like the Holocaust as white on white violence, oh, yeah, yeah. that is totally I incorrect. I, 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 I just meant I'm a historian. So yeah. I approach it as a historical question. I sorry to be clear. My bad. I've said it on the podcast before, but you shouldn't know. I would say in the and the, the the history of the Jews in America in the last 100 years is the history of whitening and, and becoming part of the white power structure. That is what I think. My apologies. Yeah. So in this and, context and, and, in 2023, you know, it is. Yeah, but you know, there are, yeah. I actually know Israeli actors who have trouble getting cast as the well, because there's Mizrahim. I mean, this is what people don't understand. Like, exactly. If you want to apply the frame of whiteness to Israel, it's very complicated because Correct. my understanding is roughly 50 percent of the population there is Mizrahim. There's other, you know, there's Ethiopian Jews, right. etc. So I just think it like when Whoopi Goldberg said the Holocaust was white on white violence, <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> yeah, just no, like that was wrong. not not really. But yeah. sorry, just to be clear. Yes. Today. Yes. Oh, I agree with you. My apologies. I think I missed it. And in yeah. this particular, <clears throat> because I do have a friend who is Israeli and who is an actor and who actually joined a little group we had for the Middle East. And, and I, I was fully um, pro him joining this group because I could see that he was suffering from the same. Um, he has an accent. He's dark and dark haired and dark curly haired. And he was not getting cast as a uh, Jack O'Brien, the the quarterback, and so and then you, you know, also we have, have weird it. situations like Oded Fair playing an Arab in the in the Mummy, right? Exactly. Like there's these sorts of mm. weird, exactly. you know, exactly. which is classic Hollywood going yeah. back a century. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, totally fine. But <clears throat> so we're clear in this particular chat group, the people who were spoken out were famous people, uh, rich people, and super white, super white, and it it took us back. Uh, you know, immediately there was sub chats, you know, and immediately in the sub chats were people of color. Um, and basically, are we leaving this chat group now? What are we doing? And it wasn't pretty. I, I don't want to reveal who uh, was the person who took a stance for Palestine. It was also somebody famous and not somebody white. So, um, um, but he did a really good job debating. And then basically the group administration said we don't want to do this here anymore that wasn't what the group was made for and so i left the group i think a bunch of other black women left the group i don't know what happened then i, I focused on you know there's a war my people are getting killed we have a responsibility to highlight what's happening i personally don't think it should be controversial to say stop bombing an entire people into the dust. Like, I cannot believe that's controversial. And people signed the ceasefire letter as well, some very big names. So at least, you know, they're stopping the war. Just what I just wanted to make one clarification. Also, in the American context, there are complexities. I hear my colleague Devin Nahr in my ear about Sephardic Jews you know, versus Ashkenazim. And so there's all these complexities. So I just want to say that I recognize that, but we're going to put it to the side for now. Yes, it's a complicated <laughs> subject. And we want to recognize also that there is Jews of color, you know, as a matter of fact, the person who ended up debating the other people pushing for like this, we're all in on Israel and we don't give a shit who else is in this chat group. That person was, you know, a Jew of color. Like there's there's, you know, we are not saying every single Jew is white, but there's a there's a certain element where you have to say, if you American, you've always lived in America, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah ab absolutely. You know? So I just had a quick question. So one of the things that I noticed on Twitter, and I don't want to call anyone out, is that younger people in the business particularly writers and, and younger writers of color seem more willing, for example, to criticize the CAA decision. So to me, this seems like a broader, um, hap like sort of within the broader context of American life where people under 40 are more sympathetic to Palestinians and people over 40 are less sympathetic. They were his historicized. You know, I could just talk about my own Jewish community. People who came of age in the 50s, 60s, and 70s have a different relationship to Israel and Palestine than people who came of age in the 90s and 2000s. So I was wondering if you see that sort of generational divide in the industry. And, and Not only do I see it, we're all in the groups together. And this is what's so amazing. And I think the reason why I really want wanted to come on this podcast. This is the only podcast I'm doing and only because he said, can we talk about Hollywood? Because I think people need to understand it, what's happening right now. Not only is there a divide now between 
people of color in Hollywood and uh, people saying we have to fire anybody who says anything nice about Palestinians, you know, huge divide. But there is a massive divide between the younger upcoming generations who are different. Like I call them the TikTokers, you know, they are different. And that includes many, many young Jews, you know. Now, I also see, although I have to say, I I don't necessarily think I am the right person to talk about this because I don't want to get in trouble. But it's fascinating for me to watch that. Obviously, our industry has, you know, a lot of Jewish people working in it. That doesn't mean they control the media because there's a lot of other people, too. So that's not what I'm saying. But it's an industry where this will come up. Right. But now you have this amazing like situation where these 20, 22 year olds, brown grads, and they're coming from all these liberal colleges, right? They're like, no, we're not doing that. That's genocide. Like, no, you know, and I, <laughs> I'm meeting all these kids and I'm like, well, how is it possible that there's this massive divide? And to be honest, it would be interesting. I would actually love to hear from somebody who is Jewish and in the industry and maybe on that leftist side, I, I know a few older ones who are on the leftist side too. They're just slightly more um, subdue about it. Like a lot of my friends, um, you know, always say, look, I hate what Israel is doing. I don't want to have nothing to do with Israel, but I will never bring this up at my Thanksgiving dinner with my family. Like that's basically the attitude I hear from most of my, like they don't want to, there's a certain age group. They don't want to bring it up and other. But this right now is very interesting because you have all these young Jews. I mean, look at what happened at the uh, in Washington, that, that protest. And I, I keep thinking, like, what's going to happen here is um, you now fired an agent or demoted her or made her take time off or whatever. You've been coming after a, a, a few people quite strong. Like, there's been, like, you know a few, I think, actors that have said something and then immediately there was backlash. Years back, I remember Javier Badiam and Penelope Cruz writing a very innocent letter about the bombings, I think, in 2014 and getting reamed and reprimanded, you know, for writing a letter that really just says, look, can we just stop? Well, it's, it's very, very interesting. And just a, a quick thing uh, to mention uh, what Lexi was talking about. There's a very famous book called An Empire of Their Own, How the Jews Invented Hollywood that goes into the deep, you know, connections between uh, Jewishness and the entertainment industry. And it, it's not anti-Semitic or a conspiracy theory to focus on this subject as a, as a topic of inquiry at all. And I'm a, you know, as a Jewish studies professor. Um, but it, this, it seems to me that this is the problem with the gerontocratic industry a little bit, that so many of the people in Hollywood who run the major studios, so many people in the major positions are just frankly of an older generation. And so the politics on a bunch of different issues have changed, you know, from the anti-capitalism to Israel, Palestine, to the American empire in the world. Um, and it's, just that in an era of decreasing resources, I think a lot of people are afraid to speak out and are, you know, much more likely to be in your DMs because it's already a hyper competitive industry. And why would you, you know, come out a, a, against uh, something that you feel like is going to be institutionally held against you? So then what what do you tell these younger members of the industry? What could one do without destroying one's career? Because on, on one hand, like, I don't think it's fair to ask someone to destroy their career in capitalism. You know, Which there's I no try social to talk them net. out. Yeah. Most of the time I try to talk them out of it. But I have to say, a lot of those young ones, especially if they're Jewish, they don't really want to hear shit from me about, like, they are just, I'm saying that my my parents brought me up differently. That's another thing. A lot of them actually are saying, I don't know if that's the Gen X parents or whatever, but um, there is a whole generation who are like, that's not what I was taught to do. And then there's another one, the whole, and that's, I think, a more millennial generation is the that documentary that just came out, Israelism. Have you heard about it? It's basically... I've heard. The, I haven't seen it, though. It, it's basically the idea that they have been brainwashed into thinking we have to stand up for Israel no matter what. And they all discovered later or on, on their birthright trip that uh, stuff is happening there that doesn't really jive with their politics. And, you know, going back to Black Lives Matter, it's very hard right now to be... You, you cannot have... BLM in your bio and be all BLM and be anti-Palestinian. And that is a conflict for a lot of people. 
some, you know, will voice this conflict rather stupid and saying, oh, I was BLM and now you're Palestinian. And it's like, you know, as they literally say stuff like that. But for the young ones who are much more, I hate to use the, the word woke now that right wing has ruined it, but socially aware, those TikTok kids that are socially aware, they understand this. They understand they can't go to a protest for BLM and, you know, also be, you know, be for a genocide in, in Palestine. And they, I also think they understand that it's a colonial issue, that, it, that it's an occupation. They understand it's apartheid. They don't want to be on that side. And I think the issue I see the most right now, uh, it's not even personal about, you know, the, the six, seven of us uh, who are actually Palestinian, some of them, some of them don't even under identify as Palestinian. Like we've had some telephone like chats going on and we have a tough time even organizing because I think we're so scared to make a group uh, you know lest somebody says we're like a Hamas or something you know but um, you know most of them you might know them as Lebanese or you know somebody may have said they are Egyptian I used to say for the longest time oh yeah my dad is from Jordan this is something Palestinians do for a lot of time just to not get in trouble. I haven't done that in a long time, but I do remember when I did this. And there's a few actors who are still doing that. And we've had a talk and we are feeling all very isolated um, with with not necessarily a lot of support individually towards us. Um, because again, you know, unless you're out like me and loud about it, they don't necessarily know that you're I have family. a quick question. Um, do your reps tell you people not to talk about it because i mean it's already again it's such a hard business it's so hard to get work if i was an agent i'd be like why are you talking about it you know like i'm with you you know as an agent yeah. might say i'm totally with you but do you have to be public about it is there sort of that language well i think my reps have given up a long time ago on that because I, i'm loud <laughs> about everything and they kind of know it's my thing um but um you know and funny enough i my lawyer my entertainment lawyer is the one lawyer in town, sadly, he's retiring now, but he's the one lawyer in town who literally represents every Arab uh, and Palestinian filmmaker. And I think we all drawn to him because he is somewhat of an anti-occupation activist. Um, and so I, I think I found the right team. Um, and, and just they, to, just to double uh, to sort of two finger what you're saying, I mean, I would say most Jews under 40 who are politically aware are, are, are the very least skeptical of the occupation, you know, at the very, at the very least. Oh, yeah. So there's a oh, yeah. huge divide. In, Massive. And this is what country. I really yeah. want to talk about because that's also happening in our industry. But what's so interesting about that is, and again, it's very hard for me to talk about this without sounding like a conspiracy theorist. And I really despise conspiracy theories, you know, because, uh, just having gone through COVID, like anytime somebody says, oh, this might be, uh, I'm like, oh, immediately stop, you know? So it's it's very hard to like put this into words. But I think, I think the, for example, the Sony hack emails, I don't know if you remember them, when this Ryan Kavanaugh email come out and you kind of saw Natalie Portman saying, why am I on this email about Israel, you know? I, I think you saw a lot of that. So I don't necessarily have to go into it more. I think one story I should tell is, um, a very good friend of mine who is a woman showrunner um, once called me out of the blue. I think oftentimes that I'm everybody's only Palestinian friend in Hollywood. And so I get a lot of these calls sometimes. Um, she calls me and she says, I'm not naming any names here, but um, I will later, if you want, forward you this document so you can see I'm not just making this up. She basically said, uh, this and this person, very powerful person in Hollywood, wants me to go to Lebanon, to Beirut, and teach these writers um, how to write. And I thought, well, there's nothing bad about teaching Arabs how to write. Um, but I thought it was a weird time to send, you know, somebody at, at that time to Beirut to do that. I, I couldn't quite figure out. This was, I think, before, like, Netflix had a whole Arab department. I thought it was very strange that... Uh, this particular person that she mentioned who asked her to go over there and it just I said can you send me like the document she wanted me she asked me because she wanted to know if she's doing if this is okay she didn't want to be part of doing something wrong and I thought that was so sensitive because most people don't think about it yet but maybe we should think about like you know who's teaching 
who's teaching them to be a voice now? Can they not have their own voice or should? Well, I mean, that's colonialism. I mean, the way that I view it is that like these every American industry reproduces the structures of empire because we live in a gigantic empire that controls the world. Um, And it's 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 very interesting. You saw, as I'm sure you're aware, a lot of countries abroad at some point in the last 30, 40 years, like banned. You couldn't have all American programming or all British programming. But what has happened now is that, you know, Western media has done like, let's say, American Idol. And now they just now it's Lebanese Idol, you know, now it's Nigerian Idol, now it's Australian Idol. So it reproduces the structures of empire that get around um, the the uh, the sort of laws. And I think that's something that 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 one sees throughout. But what what I mean, you, you're you're a veteran of the industry. What do you think the industry could do to, to sort of make um Palestinians feel more welcome to make uh, Arab uh, artists feel more welcome. I mean, one not fire people uh, yeah. for well, criticizing for U.S. One. foreign policy, but beyond beyond the obvious, you know, there are going to be some reactive tendencies amongst yeah. the power structure, which is politicized in a totally different time. But basically, what happens when the first post peace process generation comes into power, which is going to happen in the next 10, 15 years? A generation that basically lived in a world where the two state solution was never real thing that, you know, it was totally done. So what what could, what could actually we, be done? I think they need to jump on the board uh, of decolonization. It's something the youth knows about, you know, uh, when we say decolonize it, you know, white people should not have that fragility and say, oh, they're trying to kill me. You know, like nobody's trying to kill you. Nobody's trying to replace you. Nobody's trying to take your house or your job. It's not a zero sum game. There's room for all of us. And, you know, we we have to, by, by the way, I think there is incredible high anti-Semitism here, very much so. But I think it's not coming from Palestinians. Palestinians grow up knowing that Jewish people are our biggest allies. It's so, if I can just tell you, when I go to the West Bank, who is Iso Amro always working with? Jewish organizations. Who is there? 12 Jewish writers doing a documentary. Here's another Jewish director. Like, we know this. You know, we've seen, we are all on TikTok and Twitter. We we have seen how loud our Jewish allies are. This is not an issue for us anymore. Am I saying there's no anti-Semitism maybe from other groups in the Muslim world that are not as in tune with what's actually happening on the ground in Palestine? I'm sure there is. But what I really don't like is the idea that Elon Musk is anti-Semitic every two days, massive anti-Semitic, and then everybody's like, oh, he, you know, he doesn't mean it. It's not really anti-Semitism. That, to me, is really dangerous. So I think we have to be very careful of that. And and I, I think we should all unite. Like, we need to be all on one side. We, If, if we all want to dismantle um, oppression and abuse and toxic behavior, then then let's do it and let's do it together. And let's not be afraid of the word decolonize, you know, and let's not be afraid of saying from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Because if you look at the history, Jews, Christians, Muslims were all living together in an area before white people stepped their foot on it, you know, and everybody was in peace. And that's what we mean by that. You know, we mean we all should be free. And when a slogan like from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, if that slogan immediately triggers you and you think, oh, you want me dead, you want to erase all of us, you want to kill all of us. No, we're not the Germans. No, Uh, we we want to have a, a country back where we are all equal and free. And I think that as Hollywood people, as storytellers, we could contribute so much to it. One, I would say, embrace your fellow Arabs. Embrace the ones that aren't even out because they're afraid to be out. You find somebody who's Lebanese or Egyptian or ask him if maybe they're half Palestinian and they might actually admit it. Maybe right, they just don't to be clear, that's because these countries have large amounts of Palestinian refugees after the yeah. Uh, Nakba. Yeah, yeah, just also, to be like, I, clear. I know this yeah. is, <laughs> it is, and, and it also is like a very well-known thing. It's a very well-known thing that Palestinians come to Hollywood and all, all of a sudden they're anything but Palestinian, right? So um, there's many around you, many you may not even be aware of. You know, I know some that are out as Palestinians. People know they're Palestinians. I keep thinking of this young agent at that one agency 
And I keep thinking of her every day, like, what must she feel like right now? Because it's so fucking scary. And you don't have to be scared of us. We just want to be at the table. We would like to maybe rehumanize a lot of our people that have been dehumanized in a lot of entertainment. We want to work against anti-Semitism as much as we want to decolonize countries, not only in Palestine, but everywhere. And again, it's not a zero-sum game. I actually think um, that kind of progress helps all of us. And most important, you know, we have this saying that um, diversity means hiring people from different backgrounds. But true inclusion means providing an environment where everybody can succeed. We are not doing that because if I'm scared to admit I'm Palestinian or if I'm scared to say stop the genocide or if an agent is scared to say this is the red line for me, this is genocide. If you're putting that message out, you are not creating a safe environment for us to succeed and not just for Palestinians. Black artists are watching you. Latino artists are watching you. Asian artists are watching you. Everybody is watching you, looking at what you just did, and they're all afraid now. So um, you immediately created now an environment where we all have to watch our back. And that's the divide I'm talking about. That's a divide I would really like to stop. Because again, the idea that you are BLM, Black Lives Matter, but don't you dare say a nice thing about Palestinians does not jive. It doesn't jive with us. It doesn't jive with anybody, any member of an oppressed group. So I think this naturally brings us to the question is what role can art play here um, as an as an artist or in an industry of, of our artists? What what can that do to help bring light to this situation? Well, for one, I think we should, you know, Mo Armour's show on Netflix, I think, was a good example of letting somebody do his thing, show his life. But again, he he did basically show you know Mo Amar the the it's a you know and so he's a Palestinian who got on TV. We all make jokes like how the heck what happened? Who let you on TV? You know because it's so rare. But that's an that's a representation of a Palestinian American who's living a very Texas life. And I thought it was very funny that a lot of Texans people from Houston said I actually relate to that because of the whole Houston thing. Um, so it's a good way. Like we we basically. You know, we haven't had, this is a weird name to bring up now, but um, I can't really think of a better example than this. You know, the Bill Cosby show really changed um, how black people were perceived, at least when I grew up in Europe. All of a sudden, you didn't see all these black people as thugs. Um, You had this doctor with his you know, I think she was a doctor wife, I believe, or, you know, and these kids who were smart. And and it, uh, I think it was a show that massively broke through and and kind of shifted. And it's hard to believe that that wasn't there before, but it wasn't. And, you know, when you think of Arabs, um, you know, Dr. Chak Shaheen, uh, who's the late Dr. Chak Shaheen, you know, spent his entire life you know, talking about how Arabs are dehumanized in Hollywood. Uh, there's a great documentary called Real Bad Arabs. Real is R-E-E-L. And he wrote a book about that too. You can find the documentary free on the internet. And he basically went, and he was a Lebanese Christian man. He basically went through all these movies that one after another showed that we are barbaric. We are not human. You know, we are we are, we are either stupid, you know, barbaric, you know, back to the future, no reason, but suddenly the Libyans are terrorists, you know. Um, It's constantly, and it was especially hard in the 80s and 90s, it was just, there was a group that just decided, let's make these humans into dogs so that when we invade Iraq, or, you know, or and when yeah, we... And need... Said Orientalism, this is a trope going back exactly. hundreds of years exactly. of the encounter between West and East. And the basic idea is that the West is formed through the encounter with the quote unquote East, uh, you know, sort of the negative image of what the West is. So if people are interested in that, also, I would say, check out Said's Orientalism. Exactly. And so I've worked diligently to... Uh, you know, because just when we thought we were getting a little bit progressive, you had six seasons of 24 where we were always the terrorists. We're always the terrorists. The best. Want to hear something very interesting, though, on yeah. 24? The first season, I believe it was Balkan terrorists. And it's only after the second season, I believe, is the one after 9 11, where right. then the Arab. So uh, this is something you see throughout American history is that there's always a new bad guy. You know, there was, there was the Soviets, 
then there was the Arabs, then there now there's the Chinese. And so you see this movement. Where's the Germans? I don't yeah. understand. The like, Germans the Germans are there through like, the Nazis. <laughs> yeah, but you know, like why is the German not the perfect bad guy? I never get this. You know, never, you know. Um it, like we let them go like we way too fast like they made great bad guys and they'd started two world wars but anyway um so you know we really need that because you know we we make fun you know with all of our families is because for example i would be considered a black sheep in our family because Ar- arabs muslims are famous for you know you you your parents want you to be a doctor or a lawyer or at the worst an engineer you know they do not want you to they call it play in hollywood like they still refer to me you still play in hollywood and i'm like i work there yes you know <laughs> and um it, it's we joke about it now but i think that um it's very important that the few of us who are here we have to we have to give us a chance to let us de- human bring us back to humanize us because the only reason you all can watch two weeks of my people blowing up in pieces is because we are not human to you. And I tweeted something that ended up going viral, but it ended up going viral because it's absolutely true. Like white Americans, there was a video with a cat in in a, that was pulled out from under the rubble that went more viral than any kid being pulled out from under the rubble because that is what white Americans do. They can, if you tell them 10 dogs are dying in that building, they will call their representative, don't bomb that building, but we don't mean anything to them. And I sometimes think it's, it's not necessarily their fault because a lot of people in certain places, they don't know us um, as humans. They don't know that most of my cousins are doctors, you know, um, and lawyers and, uh, you know, at the worst engineers or IT people. <laughs> You know, we're just normal people um, and we're human. And and I think you see that tension very clearly in the Ukraine versus Palestine about which people are broadly embraced by the liberal intelligentsia and which people are basically ignored. Um, and so I think what, what's happening right now in Gaza uh, really highlights the tensions of the empire itself and the fact that there's no such thing as a humanitarian empire. And that that is a fantasy and that I think what's so crucial about this issue beyond the obvious like like you, uh, the bombardment that is going on, this terrible bombardment of murder of innocence is that it, it's useful at highlighting the problems with the entire basically American approach to the world and that we need to rethink things like capitalism and empire in very fundamental ways. Um, but Lexi, before we go, do you have anything else to say, um, anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to cover? Um, no, I, uh, I think, um, I think we covered most issues. If you can, please go to a protest. <laughs> if you can speak out, please speak out, be brave. I think the people who are speaking out today, even if you do lose your job, which I know many of you have, uh, I think we're on the right side of history. And sometimes I think that's more important. Thank you, uh, Lexi Alexander for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah.